Hi, uh, my name is Sheila and I'm a graduate student here at Princeton University. I have the honor today of introducing the esteemed scholars Patricia J. Williams and Sanford Quinter, both of whom have had enormous and pioneering influence in their academic disciplines and beyond, thinking, writing, and reading in and between complex encounters with ontologies and temporalities in the human condition and material world. As a scholar of law, Patricia Williams' scope of work encompasses the politics of race, gender, class, and disembodiment. Perhaps most radically, her engagement in the field of critical legal studies intersects with her professional practice as a lawyer and law educator, thus necess necessitating the domain of law practice itself to indispensably confront issues of political indeterminacy, contradiction, and individual autonomy. Within this broad field of interrogation, Williams consistently presents the body in its multifarious conditions, bodies in air, bodies of scholarship, bodily intrusions, bodies incarcerated, bodies of burden, bodies surveilled, analyzing also their respective relationship to law and language. For Williams, the very materiality of language has the potential to deform bodies as one thing or another through its structural deployments of grammar, syntax, semantics, and namely, I quote, how things live in language and how we objectify them in a way that is ultimately translated into laws. Sanford Quinter, in the span of his vast scholarship, has explored the questions of organizational structures, the relationship of the body to and within the environment, and the epistemological histories of memory, perception, and space. In using the term organization in particular, he narrates how philosophical conceptions implicate discourses of form, dislocating and transporting form from the purely biological to the realm of phenomena, like those of morphogenesis, systems theory, and the materialisms of Spinoza, Simondon, Bergson, Foucault, Deleuze, and Delanda. Quinter argues against the, I quote, too narrow notion of vision, and rather for more complex readings of the signaling environment considered by encompassing all of its indeterminacies and to further understand our embeddedness within an expanded ecological manifold. Patricia Williams is the James L. Dorr Professor of Law at Columbia University. She is the author of The Alchemy of Race and Rights, The Rooster's Egg, Seeing a Colorblind Future, The Paradox of Race, and Open House, of Family, Friends, Food, Piano Lessons, and the Search for a Room of My Own. Her award-winning column, Diary of a Mad Law Professor, has appeared monthly in The Nation magazine for two decades. Sanford Quinter is a professor of science and design at the School of Architecture at Pratt Institute in New York and the professor of theory at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. Quinter is an architectural theorist, writer, editor, co-founder of Zone Books Publishers and the author of Architectures of Time Toward a Theory of the Event in Modernist Culture, Far from Equilibrium, Essays on Technology and Design Culture, and Requiem for the City at the End of the Millennium. And with that, please welcome Sanford Quinter. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I don't really feel that I merit the podium today. Um, I didn't, I don't really have a, uh, uh, a full talk as such. Uh, a rather a kind of mosaic, and um, I'm going to figure out how to arrange myself here. Do I need to talk into the mic? Is that important? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um. And this is kind of the graveyard shift uh, here at Saturday in, um, in, uh, at Princeton, um, and, and I mean that in a few ways, of course, and that is that. <laughs> You know, I barely made it myself, so don't worry. Uh, the point, though, is that I want to say in advance, uh, you know, in some ways you're, uh, in some ways you're imprisoned by what your idea was a week and a half ago when you started thinking about a conference, and that may have changed, and it has changed multiple times since I've been sitting here. Uh, too late to change um, my, my approach, but what I did want to say is some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today I want you to know, however painful they are for you, they're going to be just as painful for me. And secondly, uh, I, partly because I had imagined myself talking to a fair number of architects in the room, and I happen to know there's only one. Uh, oh, hey, Mitch, you came. I, no, I appreciate that very much. Um, 
But honestly, all right, okay, guys. So like we're all we got a small club here. Oh, yeah, that's true. But honestly, the point that I want to make. <laughs> me too. Me too. I um um. What was the point of all this? I was going to um, say, yes, that what you talk about, there's a rhetoric in what you decide to talk about. Um, so forgive me in advance and keep that idea in mind, uh, that part of what I chose to talk about today was that. Also, you know, architects tend to encourage you to do very sadistic talks. Uh, and I'm not going to point anyone out uh, particularly, but some of the conference organizers felt that it was uh, important to encourage me uh, to go for um, pain rather than fun. But in any case, um, let's begin. I would, whoa, I see a PowerPoint here with 157 images, but that's not possibly mine. So uh, the title and blurb I provided to the conference planners uh, represents one of many possible routes of approach to the problem I have tried for the last couple of years to grasp within a single element or frame. Uh, in fact, its singleness is something I know and feel and can attest to through a variety of experiences. The singleness is also a feature of its meaning and significance and so must also be a topic of attention. The difficulty of transmitting it to a reader or audience with the same unity of presentation it enjoys in the world could be construed as one of the very problems tacitly posed by this conference's title, which partly has to do with the latent incommensurabilities of what presents in physical or psychic existence and what can be adequately made present in language. What I really feel like I'm doing here, or attempting to do, um, hubristic as it may be, is to, uh, is to assemble a very strict monism. One of the problems that is encountered along the way to such efforts of presentation is the perennial but false identification of mind with language, which has operated for some time now as the tacit foundation for the bifurcation of reality into segregated domains. This bifurcation is the precondition of the damaged landscape in which idealisms and other foundational confusions are able to grow. You'll see, sometimes I, I, it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse, but it's partly because of the particular uh, trends uh, that I, you know, I feel are uh, circulating today, especially in the, uh, well, I in my own field, for example, and um, um, generally speaking in culture. So to address the it to which my last sentences refer, the best I can state in advance of any demonstration of a defensible pathway that leads up to it is that it refers to any occasion in which something previously undisclosed in the world presents itself to another part of the world capable of apprehending it. However vague this may sound, I do not mean it to be an evasion. I want to refer in the most general possible way to the activity through which information, form, or pattern is extracted from the world without partitioning the world into specialized parts, one that natively, ones that natively present and parts that natively apprehend. In other words, and roughly speaking, into matter and mind. My it contains another supposition, that those parts of the universe engaged in the act of apprehending grasping or seizing are the beneficiaries not so much of a product gained in the transaction that can be stored, but of an enhancement or augmentation of potential, most importantly of the potential to apprehend. I mean that in the purely philosophical sense um, uh, of potential. So I won't hide the intimation here that what we have to do with can be construed as a problem of consciousness be it a consciousness of uncertain or undetermined locality. And in that sense, I, I feel like uh, I, I want to refer to the qu a question I asked yesterday to Karen in terms of the role of Vedantic uh, philosophy um, in the wave equations and later on the theory, the attempt to theorize life by Schrodinger, et cetera. In a certain sense, it was based in a principle which he could probably not have extracted, if you like, from his own tradition 
of that omni uh, loca locationality, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But a judicious use of the term consciousness would not be the worst thing here. To affirm that the predicate of a potential distributed in nature belongs necessarily and indifferently to the domains of both mentation or mind and all the versions of the maturation of matter with which we have become comfortable from evolutionary theory through the progression of the first and second laws, the laws of conservation, and then the concept of gradient in thermodynamics that were primary, shall we say, ontological and not only scientific contributions of the 19th century. The common origin of concepts of potential and distributed intelligence, I use that term in quotes here, in nature as underlying endowments of what is both human and beyond human goes back, and when I say beyond human, I refer purely to what is not us, that's to say uh, non-human nature, goes back to the first explanatory efforts of the Greeks as in the concept of a logos that is said to administer the whole universe and from whence I um, derived my use of the word lawfulness, which alas, I'm sure was not a, a, a good enough um, bridge necessarily to, um, uh, uh, to Patricia. Uh, but it may turn out to be. Um, wisdom is one thing, to know the intelligence through which all things are steered through all things. Wisdom here is the apprehension of the steering intelligence. The steering intelligence is the dynamo, or more precisely, the mode of intelligible appearance, both of which follow definite and presumably readable patterns. Someone yesterday asked, is that really reading? Do you have to call that reading, that kind of apprehension or that uh, intuition or that grasp, if you like, of, of a thing out there? I would say, why not? I mean, it's what we're all responding to. Um, but I see it as a kind of capture. Um, and I'm probably going to try and elaborate that as much as possible. In modern times, it was Spinoza who restored the unity of the two seemingly divergent modes, one of which was thought or mind, the other extension or physical reality or space and matter. He did this through his concept of a single differentiable and expressible substance invested with inexhaustible potentia. And so invested, Spinoza's concept of nature was no second in majesty to any conception of God. And curiously enough, Spinoza is not really, uh, I mean, Spinoza is around these days, kicking around more than ever, and I imagine uh, we will see a lot more of him soon. Uh, but I do point out that, you know, various philosophers, even, you know, political philosophers like uh, Tony Negri have tapped that idea of potentia uh, in their own work. So for contemporary audiences, one can do no better than to invoke the work of Gilbert Simondon, who is receiving renewed attention these days. Is that legible? Oh, and that's why. Oh, you can read the pink, good. Ah, so the following two sentences are provided in both the French and in a now corrected English translation. For these two sentences served as the impetus for my presentation today. I draw attention to the two following expressions, to, or to the following expressions, there we go. The phrase analogical individuation of knowledge within the subject. I miss this, well I myself miss this, um, the importance of this emphasis in my translation of Simondon's introduction published in 1993 uh, in Zone 6 uh, incorporations, um, for Simondon is in fact explicitly asserting that the capture of the movement of being, the appearing of an individual, and the information and hence salience it engenders, and when Simondon uses the term information, Curiously enough, writing in the 50s, uh, you know, and obsessed with cybernetics as he was, he actually doesn't mean information in the way we understand it. He really means that 
F-O-R-M portion of the word information uh, to be understood as an active um, uh, making of form. And the information and salience it engenders can be accomplished only by a parallel movement matched by the apprehending entity that meets it. Somehow I figure that can't possibly be clear to you. Let me see if um, I explain it. Um, it simply means that, uh, that the individuation or the movement that individuates the world can be captured only not by the mind, but by the individuating movement of the mind itself. In other words, the mind itself is a con in a continuous process of unfolding and self-realizing. In some ways, this is similar to what is expressed in neuroscience by the phrase, quote, neurons that, wire, that fire together, wire together. For what unfolds in physical reality unfolds also in brain and mind, and only by dint of such parallel or coordinated unfoldings. And uh, note the parallelism of within and beyond here that carry no further division in Simondon's thought. Simondon's full ontological account addresses the four essential levels of human experience. I can't believe my PowerPoint's working. And, um, the physical, the living, the psychic, and the collective or social. In what proves to be a modular concatenation, each builds on and draws from the previous, more simple one that serves, as it were, as a reservoir of potential, what he calls a residue of pre-individual that is never fully resolved or exhausted for the next, for the next layer. And he does, by the way, uh, he does conceive of this as energy. Um, each individuation does require a quotient of energy um, in order to individualize. This pre-individual is the component of undifferentiated being that remains immanent and active within commonplace beings, even when invisible and unexpressed. Individuation, whether in thought or matter, represents a presentation or a penetration to an immanent, that's I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T, to an immanent beyond. And the reason it can be both immanent and beyond is because it is that mobile reservoir that travels along with beings um, and which is the, uh, the foundation of its uh, ultimate in intelligibility, salience, or distinction. Simondon goes on to emphasize that what is grasped or known by the conventional substantialist mind is a platitudinous and improperly understood reality. For one habitually mistakes the products of being, things, for the larger, more interesting, and primary system, he always insists on system, of operations and modifications through which being performs. Simondon is most famously, especially to readers, for example, of, uh, of uh, Deleuze, most famously known for his critique of Aristotelian hylomorphism, another misleading dualist understanding of salience or appearance, one which deprives matter, as was often invoked throughout this conference, of its inherent productive dynamism and, uh, to go back to the ancients, intelligence. Thought, perception, sensation are hence compelled to individuate in order to capture the individuations, especially the new forms, qualities, and expressions in the physical and material world that delight and inform us. For there is something inherently pleasurable and not only necessary in, in all such capture. This is what Simondon calls transduction. Somebody just left, and I hope it was you. Yeah, yeah actually, you, be, you know, he was a, uh, you don't know this, but he's a philosopher, very, uh, he, he talks a no, lot about electronics. Like transduction. I know, I know, he borrows the word right from electronics. The substantial restlessness common to the life of matter and mind due to that same excess of being, the, 
the reservoir of pre-individual that persists in every state. The resonant harmonic convergence of the two streams of becoming is described as an analogic operation. How about that? Okay. The analogic principle, sometimes referred to as a parallelism, posits a co-individuation in which there is a concrete transfer of operations, or structuration, yeah, there we go, structuration, uh, which I guess in English would be really understood as a realization and concretization from one milieu. Okay, so here it is. The posits a co-individuation in which there is a concrete transfer of operations from one milieu or domain to another, what he calls a setting into relation of two processes, one that operates outside thought and hence outside of subjects with ones that operate within and make up the movement of thought itself. Now for efficiency, I use the term, especially for what is going to ensue, I use the term thought for every interior or sensory disposition that one has toward the physical world, regardless of whether emotion, perception, thought, or pure sensation. This operation, which sometimes sounds like cognition and sometimes like a statement about nature, need not be read substantially differently from the simple act of putting into relation of systems of, and again, another Simondonian sort of jargon uh, phrase, different orders of magnitude that Simondon describes as when a plant establishes within itself relations with the molecular capacities found in soil minerals and moisture and connects these to the macroscopic cosmic scale forces radiating, radiating from the sun in order to establish itself formally as plant. In conclusion, there is a perennial monist project, indeed a lucid and sober realism that legitimately pursues an account of world that conceives of mind and matter as excitable media, both. Uh, that's to say indifferently as in excitable media and which does not divide that world but rather demonstrates the immanence of the one in the other. For somewhere in that always open and unfolding relation, that mutual sensing of, I guess I'm going to under, you know, under erasure you could say right now of self and world, mind and, and, and extension, uh, that mutual sensing, are we capable of deploying ourselves in as yet unacknowledged and undeclared ways? What remains vastly undiscovered in the record of human affairs is the variety and scope of human sentience, human capacity to penetrate by means of directed psychic experience into what is dimly intuited regarding discoverable relations with things beyond. For Simondon, the problem that needs to be solved and met by the understanding are the modes of how th beings arise and the relations that this arising both express expresses and establishes. All right, it's the end of Simondon. So I would like now to describe another extraordinary moment in the history of thought in which this problem was addressed Uh, the moment I refer to is in one of Alfred North Whitehead's first lectures at Harvard on 18th century knowledge in which he directs our attention to the famous argument of Bishop Berkeley. By the way, do you guys know that George Berkeley was the origin of the name of your university? Those of you in the room from Berkeley. Did you know that while you were there? No. Um, uh, regarding the status of external versus mental objects. Whitehead begins his lecture by summarizing the intellectual accom accomplishments of the 17th century, which, according to him, was to have successfully divided being into two realms, that of material on one side and mind on the other. We recognize in this the 17th century, of course. But to have conceived these both abstractly which means to have made them both representable in terms of simple location, 
Whitehead's famous dismissive expression for the abstractive poverty of mechanism. He refers uh, 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 to the earlier century, too, of uh, Bacon's uh, concept of induction, um, which he describes as a, also an abstractive process. I mention it because of it has the, it's the, it's the mentational aspect, shall we say, of this misprision uh, uh, of matter. But at the same time, there is a underlying, um, maybe there's an underlying unity being expressed in it. He then proceeds with his famous proclamation, this is Whitehead, that the role of philosophy is, quote, to serve as the critic of abstractions. And in so doing, he throws the gauntlet. Whitehead draws our attention to the work of George uh, Berkeley, the curious solipsist idealist who denies outright the existence of matter and acknowledges only the reality of what is held and formed in the mind. Berkeley's widely commented example from the dialogue of Alciphron of three disparate entities, the castle, the planet, and the cloud, which he claims are able to exist in the mind together as an ensemble right here and now, although they are demonstrably not the objects, quote, we suppose to exist at a distance. This formulation to Whitehead becomes the breakthrough for a fundamental insight with respects to his own philosophical system. To Berkeley's question, did I put this in? No. What do we mean by a thing being realized in the world of nature? I hope that was as good as a slide. Whitehead proceeds to extract from Berkeley's position a theme that remained largely obscured even to him. What was it? It was the theme of a unification, even if it was stated exclusively in Berkeley as the unity of ideas in God. Whitehead then proceeds to transform, in fact, deliberately to contort and misread Berkeley's argument by taking hold of his concept of perception, which he relates to the previous induction of, ba of Bacon, and applying it now to real physical objects. He takes Berkeley's idea that natural entities are realized through the act of being grasped and perceived within the unity of the situated mind and transposes this situating and unification, this condensing perception operation into the non-centered world of extended matter. We can substitute the concept that the realization is a gathering of things into the unity of a prehension and that what is thereby realized is the prehension, not the things. And Whitehead, Whitehead is actually a brilliant writer in some ways and an absolutely repulsive writer in other ways. Um, but, and he comes up with this bizarre expression. He calls it uncognitive prehension. I mean, in a way, he's still, you know, he's one of these contorting philosophers, uh, uh, you know, essentially wrestling a concept. But here, he's actually transforming Berkeley's idealism into his own uh, realism. This prehension concept is, of course, the keystone of Whitehead's process philosophy. Whitehead, citing both Spinoza's infinite modes and Leibniz's monads, proceeds to declare the underlying activity of prehension as the actual, primary, concrete activity and manifestation of being. That's a lot to swallow. Whitehead's metaphysics, as most of you know, is saturated with jargon. To simplify, I've limited myself here to treating a single term, prehension, with that understanding, with the understanding I prov and with that understanding, I provide the following schematization. For Whitehead, the world is made up of specific and changing meaningful unifications, each composed of aspects of diverse entities entering into composition with aspects of other entities, with no entities, either proximate or remote, being excluded from this perpetual creative process 
of ingression, he calls it ingression. They press, if you like, into other things. Hence, the concrete fact is process. Its primary analysis is into the underlying activity of prehension and into realized prehensive events. And later, perception is simply cognition of prehensive unification. In fact, it's prehension of prehension. In sum, and grosso modo, perception and the actual occasions of nature, that is reality, are conjoined through the mutual interlocking relations in a single expansive development. The units of such a continuum, which are also infinitely separable, are famous, famously called events and organisms. And the great phrase that's been one of my favorites for decades. Physics is the study of simple organisms. Biology is the study of complex organisms. So with these ontological arguments set in motion, and I admit to you quite frankly that these were largely introduced rhetorically, let's say, into the universe in which uh, you know, the student you know, architects, et cetera, et cetera, for whom are showing various signs of being interested in foundational problems, again, especially with space, time, and most importantly, experience. Uh, with these ontological arguments set in motion, we can skip blithely to areas of more vivid interest. Our ontologists, be they the pre-Platonic ancients, Spinoza, Whitehead, or Simondon, sought precisely to remove the breaks from nature, declaring that there is only one world. But if this is true, shouldn't we be able not only to state it in language, but also to know it, experience it implicitly in life? How do we access this state of continuity, even in differentiation, which represents the potentia from whence we and all other particulars around us arise. When we approach the question of human interior experience or how we metabolize the data of our senses, are we forced to admit that we remain, I mean, we are forced to admit that we remain almost fully still in the dark. We don't know much about dreaming and we can still astonish ourselves to be reminded that it is a twilight to which we return unquestioningly on a daily basis, hiding the very bizarreness of this daily visit, even from ourselves. Where do we go when we daydream, partake in fervid erotic activity, dive deeply below the ocean surface, or simply listen to music? Music presents another remarkable example. While omnipresent, like sleeping and dreaming, it is yet totally unexplained. It's rare to find a person who does not listen to music, and it is categorically impossible to find a culture, either in past or present, that does not practice it. There are no human groups who do not engage in musical performance and production, and the practice long precedes even the advent of language and tools. Music and its panoply of effects is everywhere and has always been, and yet we do not know from where it comes. To the, fundamental to the fundamental question, where does music come from, there is to date not even a partial answer. We do not know where music inheres, even when it is in full course around us. Is it out there where matter moves and resonates, or rather inside us, like a pattern generator that does not and cannot rest, and that endlessly and wordlessly both sends and receives. Music and its precursor, charismatic sound, and by that I mean any sound that is of interest to a particular animal, arguably represents a common point of genesis of both the sentient registration of the world and of living matter as an open or cybernetic system. 
it's also infinitely transferable. In fact, it is by nature something that is a pattern that continually transfers, impresses, um, and imprints. Every human be begins life as an undifferentiated cluster of cells that during its own early ontogenesis begins to respond to or at least register stimulus arriving from its proximate but indefinite surround. The first stimuli or signal or signal set from an other dimension is that of sound patterns originating outside the womb in the world in which the mother lives. From within the undifferentiated and neutral amniotic universe within which the embryo is immersed, the rhythmic sounds of the mother's background heartbeat, breath, and gastric burbling would be experienced as both originating from and terminating within a self. In other words, these are endogenous, shall we say, patterns and sounds, unlike that other sound that comes from beyond. But the first structured psychic rapport with objects or relationships dimly sensed to exist beyond immediate reach would present here, even in the not yet individuated body-mind, as the foundation of the perennial impulse toward disclosure that is the basis of all intelligibility and existential understanding, if not, in fact, the full human experience of revelation. The concurrence of affects exhibited here, and what I mean by simultaneous introceptive excitation and equanimous bliss that perhaps characterizes that particular in, uh, moment, if you like, in the life, in the uh, ontogenesis, let's say, of the organism, will be addressed in a, Brit, in a bit. I do suggest that there is a kind of an imprinting. I don't actually get to be able to develop the, the, the context as well as I would like, but suggest simply to say is that the connection of the feeling associated with the uh, reception of the information um, is a very, very significant one and remains with us as a kind of an armature um, forever, and which is the source of, the, of, of a certain re, shall we say, um, experiencing of this in in undifferentiated uh, state and undifferentiated state of knowledge. These sounds, particularly the regular and reassuring ones, such as the mother's unstressed speaking voice and that of her life partner, would become the scaffold upon which the developing nervous system would unfold and in turn the seed around which the massively encephalizing human organism would unfurl its so-called self. Newborn brains are already tuned to the prosody of their parents' native languages, which can be demonstrated within 18 hours of birth. The rate of neurogenesis at this stage of its development is upwards of 100,000 neural connections per second. And the precondition for any of these connections to become reinforced and incorporated permanently into the gray matter substrate is to fire in coordination with received stimulus. That's to say the external world is, is relied on actually for the development of the brain. The brain cannot develop without, um, uh, without a continual um, uh, stimulus from the world itself. Uh, it's worth also pointing out that humans are, unlike any other, shall we say, nervous system in the world, uh, develop uh, for months and months, years actually, uh, outside the womb. And that's to say most brain development, most significant brain development happens outside the womb, which is associated with the, what, what neuroscientists call the secondary repertoire. But what it essentially means is our brains, more than any other animal, are, pat are actually generated by um, external reality. That's to say the handshake is a particular one in our case um, and not sufficiently acknowledged in the way we begin to understand who we are. The demand for stimulus is the brain's only hedge for survival. And so great, it is so great that it virtually hunts its sensory landscape for signal or pertinent features. There are two examples we're getting somewhere, I think. We'll get some concrete soon. There are two examples of recent acoustic research that I thought it would be interesting to address as a way to begin to extend this account of somatocognitive experience to peak or non-ordinary sentience generally. The first has to do with the work of Bernie Krauss, 
and the founding of the field of e acoustic ecology. I'm, I'm looking to your eyes. I'm looking to your eyes, huh? Please. Pardon? Not acoustic ecology. Well, uh, you I'll know, the let me just tell you, I'm st I, I, okay. <laughs> Krauss, composer, bioacoustician, and author of the Great Animal Orchestra, began recording natural landscapes in the 1970s, and through deep listening and spectrographic analysis of his field recordings, made a series of foundational discoveries with respect to biodiversity dynamics, niche partitioning, temporal ecology, and so on, that had never been grasped before through other forms of observation or registration. The terms biophony, geophony, and anth anthropophony are his and express the scope of the integrative framework of understanding that he has contributed to our capacity to extract information from our ambient surround. Now, if you want to relax, I will tell you this, is I am not dealing with any of that stuff. I will try today to focus only on the psychological aspects. No, I, I'm happy to get in the ring, but, but, but it's not going to happen today because I'm not interested in talking about that part. Here is one of Krauss, I'm interested in one, yeah, here is one of Krauss's first unbelieving accounts of a recording session early on. You can, I guess, follow the dancing ball here. I was startled by each new sound. Many of the subtle acoustic textures around me were made larger than life through my stereo headphones, of which I cranked the monitor levels so that I wouldn't miss anything. The impact was immediate and forceful. Impressions of lightness and space were alluring and lustrous. I? The ambivalence was I'm sorry, the ambience was transformed into minute detail that I would have never caught with my ears alone. What he's actually doing is he's training himself in a certain attunedness uh, and a certain uh, uh, type of attention, uh, which happens purely through this extraordinary experience of spontaneous, in a way, transport. The sound of my breathing, the slight movement of a foot adjusted into a more comfortable position. We heard a lot about that on the first day, in fact. Um, a sniffle, a bird landing nearby on the ground, stirring up leaves and then pushing air with its wing beats in short, quick puffs as it took off, alarmed. I hear pieces of the oral fabric in such gloriously clear detail that I am still surprised by how much I, am, I was previously missing. When I turn up the volume slightly above what I can hear unaided, I get and quote, uh, I get an out-of-this-world impression that I imagine astronomers might feel when they receive Hubble telescope images of exploding supernovas from the far reaches of the universe. In case it required any, you know, being beaten over the head with it, um, uh, what I mean to do here is to make it really clear that um, it, we have a kind of a recapitulation of that, let's say, uh, fantasy of... Um, uh, I I of uh, intrauterine um, sentience uh, and as a, as a fundamental, uh, shall we say, imprinting um, uh, scaffold. The second example has to do with what is known as binaural sound. I wish I had written that out for you. Um, binaural sound, recording, and playback, and its recent breathtaking deployment in an experimental theatrical production from London entitled The Encounter. I'm just wondering, did anyone see it? Did anyone see it? No. You did? Wow. I'm, let's, I'd be interested to hear whether what happened to you happened to me. No. Okay. Uh, I will not attempt in such short space to describe the heart-stopping... That was a stern look on your face. Um, uh, in such short space to describe the heart-stopping effects this work generated, but will focus simply on two details for consideration. The first is to explain what the singularity of binaural sound is, which in simple language is referred to as three-dimensional sound. Three-dimensional sound is neither stereo nor surround sound, but something far more penetratingly intense because of how forcefully it embeds us and attunes us in a prehensive space. 
The term binaural refers to it, the scrupulous separation of the right and left ear signals, so that spatial location of sound sources is delivered with such piercing acuity, almost unnatural, as well as all of the environmental information which is, not, which is normally filtered out simply by the attentional filters that the brain provides. In other words, it bypasses the normal filtration process is necessary, if you like, for useful cognition and actually embeds us, if you like, in a, uh, an incredibly intense, frankly, informational bath. Uh, this is largely due to the fact that the brain is acutely um, endowed with a capacity to process infinitesimal differences in, say, amplitude and the delay, uh, the arrival times in each ear, uh, and so on. Also because the pinna, everybody's, every person's pinna uh, uh, earlobes are uh, entirely different shapes, not to mention their nose, their face, that's to say is the, 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 the timbral aspect of sound as it's deformed as it passes across the face. For example, when we hear sound we are hearing an enormous amount of the information that our own bodies impress into the sound um, image. Uh, a perfect example of this, and anyone in this room could experience it, who essentially is to get a binaural recording that is done in someone else's head and then listen to it. And you immediately know, that's not my head. And, but you don't know that you know that, that you can know such a thing. Anyway, the transfer of information from world to receiver is so totalizing that it typically causes profound somatic and psychic stirrings, often ecstatic or deeply disturbing and typically both at once. So uh, this is, uh, here he is, this is uh, Simon McBurney doing his thing on stage. Um, the thing he's talking to is a uh, binaural head dummy. Um, and what you simply need to understand here is that uh, the, there are pinna, there actually are um, earlobes uh, on the dummy, that's the whole point, and the separation of the two receiving um, uh, entities are, ex well, they're more or less like a face. It actually has a face on the front. Um, the signal is being transmitted to all the audience members who are all wearing headphones. So what you're getting, of course, is you're getting a pure signal um, and the impression of proximity and not to mention the fact that the extraordinary uh, ability to sense the trans, uh, the, the movements, if you like, in the space as he walks around it, etc. Uh, provide um, a very, an almost frightening, um, continuous uh, experience. The second detail has to do with the content of the performance in question, which recounts in first-person form a real event from, the 1960, from 1969 when National Geographic pho photographer Lauren McIntyre became lost in the Amazon among an uncontacted forest tribe. In his quest, and in his quest for survival, came to endure among a variety of otherworldly agonies and tests, a ritual administration of 5-methoxy-dimethyltryptamine, uh, a profoundly psychedelic compound found in the venom of the Sonoran desert toad. The remarkably skillful orchestration of the encounter succeeded during this climax in the narrative to substantially transport the viewer at once inwardly and outwardly to a remote and exotic yet disconcertingly familiar place of profound and open polyvalent sensorial and psychic access that quite frankly uh, temporarily suspended most sensation of the boundary of a me and a not me. Uh, these effects precisely um, are, well, these effects are routinely uh, achieved these days in experimental neuropsych uh, VR labs that people are using virtual reality to, and it usually it doesn't take more than a few minutes to convince a person that uh, they are not in their body or that their body belongs to someone else and so on and so on. Um, Another, potential, another important aspect I think that's worth saying, uh, uh, mentioning about uh, the dissociations, the difference between dissociations affected through classic VR, which is to say through vision versus those through sound, is that sound is processed very differently, if you like, in the brain. One of the three roots actually goes through the, um, 
the, uh, the cerebellum, uh, which is a very ancient part of the, um, of, the, of the brain, and which uniquely, and unlike most visual perception, um, is able to elicit um, emotional, um, uh, uh, emotional response. Uh, I should really move on quickly here. I wanted to say one thing about the jungle. I should look. Anyway, it takes place in the jungle. The jungle happens to be a very specific type of environment because everything is alive. Um, and we're talking about a world, especially, of course, we're talking about the Amazon, in which there are these extraordinary vegetalista uh, cultures um, uh, which emerge in which it's, a, I mean, it's an animistic universe, if you like, but it's also true that the the chemistry and the plants and the way they use their environment, if you like, and the way they connect, if you like, the phytochemistry with the, with the, the body states, shall we say, with, the, with the, their culture, shall we say, their, 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 their psychotropic culture, their religious culture, spiritual culture, and obviously the ecological, the, 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 eco the, the ecological context that it represents, not to mention, of course, thinking about the Amazon jungle and the way it fits so critically into the larger global um, ecology is something is extraordinarily interesting because, in fact, it is something you find even in urban contexts in South America. Uh, the lore, shall we say, of the ayahuasca ceremony and of its capacities in cultures, uh, it's something that permeates their culture very much like language. When I was down there, I was shocked. It, I mean, very much like, not like language, but very much like music does in ours. Um, it's something that is continually there. So I like the term newology these days for a host of reasons, one of which is to do with William James's choice of the related term noetic to characterize a certain quality of rare and authoritative experience, that's his term, on which he reported in his Varieties of Religious Experience, to wit, the simultaneous sensation of unity, oceanic feeling, loss of individuality, later called ego dissolution, accompanied by the certainty that these are not only states of feeling, but also states of knowledge. These experiences, he notes, are typically recorded as permanent insights into reality, or me, realities beyond usual human reach, are often transformative, are accompanied by powerful feelings, include a convincing sense of unity and identity with outward reality, and more often than not, are characterized as incommunicable or ineffable, ostensibly because ungraspable by the discretizing operations of language. Hmm? Okay. I will, uh, I will choose my exit, just a moment. I'm going to leave it with, I'll, I'll, this is a good place to end. Um, um, where am I? Lacking any better term, James referred to these as mystical states, placed them as close as he was able toward the center of human concern, stating famously, no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. The firmness of James's conviction about states of extraordinary sentience, penetration, and access that lie close to but outside our routine ones is no surprise once one learns of his transformative encounter with transpersonal noesis that determined the entire course of his philosophical and psychological work. The engagement I'm referring to here um, is sub has been referred to as the anesthetic revelation. It began with his study and review of a work by the philosopher Benjamin Paul Blood entitled The Anesthetic Revelation and the Gist of Philosophy, in which the argument was made that the inhalation of nitrous oxide would provide extraordinary real access to dimensions of understanding otherwise limited only to rare persons or occasions. James reviewed Blood's, Blood's pamphlet, remained obsessed with its sober but extraordinary propositions, eventually experimented with nitrous oxide himself, and then experienced a profound and ecstatic, what he called ontologic emotion, 
an access of understanding, an ultimate resolution with respects to his lifelong reading and irritation at the work of Hegel. And this is, okay, I, I, I tell you, when I discovered this, I thought it was hilarious. So obviously, James proceeded to publish not only the rational fruits of this achieved understanding, the essay was called On Some Hegelisms, but also a three-page account appended to that very article of the larger experience of psychic access of which it was but a single practical part. The nitrous oxide revelations determined most of the impetus of James's arguments and insights throughout the varieties of religious experience. They are, in fact, retroactively legible for anyone who is attuned to them. And are that to which is attributed much of James' radical emphasis on experience his overhauling of conventional one-dimensional empiricism, that's to say his founding of the idea of radical empiricism, his term, which is, such, which is simply that the idea that all perception is meaningful, his embrace of pluralism and his embrace of the fundamental development of open, an open-endedness of the material universe uh, and of human being. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to end there. Um, let's say that's the end. Uh, okay, I, I too wish to thank Daniela Zulek and Mari, all of you who have made this such an exciting gathering, uh, and particularly for me, who is a little bit beyond the disciplinary pale here. Um, in particular, I, I want to uh, note that it is as a result of very long conversations with both Eduardo and Daniela uh, that th this is what has brought me to such a very different place than I think I would be otherwise. Um, both of you two have dragged me to a, a sort of uncomfortable and unfamiliar place. I'm trained as a lawyer, uh, which I offer as a kind of apology for what follows. Um, not at all in literature or philosophy to say nothing of architecture. And so I feel somewhat out of my element, um, but the materials with which I work have such material consequences, we say in law, and I, if I can misuse that term in this context, I think it's really important to try to apply the very careful kind of thought, uh, the very meticulous kinds of dissection um, that you all have brought to every moment of this conference. Um, the meticulous kinds of dissection I would like to see applied to law, and which I fear is frequently not, um, and to the broad project of justice in a world so riven both by technological short-sightedness, rampant inequality, and category mistake, to say nothing of presumptions of untranslatability. Um, and uh, so I, I called this Between the Lines Beyond the Pale, Reading the Blank Body, um, I was intrigued by uh, much of what Sanford was talking about. Uh, I particularly had a random association with the question of, uh, 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 what did he ask? Um, where does music come from? Um, because uh, it's, it's uh, I think, underappreciated the degree to which the word law, unlike lex and legal, uh, which has a Latinate root, um, law is actually, actually comes from the Old Norse, and it means stroke or a drumbeat. And so there is something really rhythmic or harmonic. Uh, there, is about, there is a kind of making music and ordering of um, the world that is implied in the project of law. Um, and that uh, perhaps captures some of what I am trying to do um, in, this, in, in this project. So I'll give you two very quick stories to set the stage of the kinds of general problems that I'm thinking about. Uh, and, 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 and again, this, the two stories are fairly obvious, I suppose, um, at one level. Um, I, Columbia recently installed this platform called Canvas, um, which is a platform for cl classroom conversation. Everybody sort of has a conversation while you're lecturing, and it's a way for students to be in, to, uh, to be in conversation with each other and with the professor. But in teaching me how to use it, I went down to IT and I began to see that it wasn't just a site for social connection, but it was also a ranking mechanism <laughs> in some relatively hidden system of institutional merit. 
Um, but I wasn't told that this was even a thing. I was simply told how to which button to press to make what happen. But while they were teaching me the system, I just happened to notice on their screen um, and ask what this obvious numerical ranking was over on the margin of, you know, Professor so-and-so number one, Professor so-and-so number two, all the way through the entire faculty. Um, and it was obvious, yet located so far over to the margin as to be almost beyond the frame. <laughs> what does that refer to? And they told me, oh, well, that's just a ranking that will help you know what your students find interesting about your lectures. <laughs> And so, of course, none of us are actually communicated this information in that form, but nevertheless, it was that abstraction, that prominent lie of, of course, it's for your own good. Um, and so this, you know, it, and, and so what it means is that it ranked how many uh, hits uh, you got, or how, at what point and, and how many times your students uh, communicated with each other about what you were talking about. Um, so it's purely a numerical engagement with what you're with what you're talking about, and so this previously sort of undisentangled, dare I say, part of myself became legible as clean, clear, made free of all context. Now I am sort of informed as a ranked number in this system <laughs> that judges the merit of my professorial professions based on how many hits I have, how many clusters of mention among students. Um, but without any relation to what I'm actually talking about, it was probably what I was wearing on any particular day. Other, no, you know, mon no mention other than as a relation to something like a wave interval in the ebb and flow of my words or the tidal flow of my talking. And so this canvassed apparition of myself, the pinpoints of connection to me as mapped by others has become a sort of walking avatar of myself. The markers of where my voice resounded, the volume, the frequency, but not the content measured. Um, but it's very clear we're ultimately probably going to get some kind of you know, salary participation based on <laughs> merit <laughs> based on this. So another example um, is I, I went to the doctor recently and, and, and encountered what's generally called black box medicine, where you are diagnosed by algorithms. Um, so for example, some, some examples that, that have made the news are a closed loop artificial pancreas, for example. Who's to blame if it doesn't work? I mean, it comes up in laws. Who carries the liability? Um, if it doesn't, um, is, so who, and correcting it is really subject to data privacy laws and concerns, and because the info of how it calculates uh, insulin levels is proprietary rather than shared. And so here's my own experience. I'm at the age where they do bone scans. <laughs> do you have osteoporosis or osteopenia? So they read the scan, and then they turn um, to a literal black box. Um, my doctor took the radiograph of my bones, sits down in front of a computer screen that entirely obscured his head. I mean, there was a big black box where his head should have been. He wasn't looking at me. And he feeds in my data to figure out the probability of whether I'll have a fracture within the next 10 years. Um, and in doing so, there was this long silence from behind <laughs> the screen, an uncomfortably cleared throat. Um, the, the machine can't analyze you. It doesn't work. Another long, uncomfortable silence. It, it, <clears throat> I think it's because you're black. Um, the machine won't calculate your odds. <laughs> it simply refuses to. Um, and so I sat there, and I was faced with sort of the ultimate choice. And I decided to do, you know, because I... I do some work in this area. <laughs> and I decided, so I, I realized that the machine would read me if I somehow redefined myself. And so I decided to do a reverse Rachel Dolezal. Um, she's a normatively white woman <laughs> who has insisted that she's black or black identified or transracial, um, sparking all kinds of debates. I will spare you here. Anyway, I told my doctor, consider the possibility that I am white or also white or simultaneously possibly black or white with a high risk of jellyfish. Anyway, <laughs> all of a sudden, the engine chugged back into motion <laughs> and asked me a whole series of questions that anybody ought to have asked me from the very beginning of the process. Did my mother have osteoporosis? <laughs> did she break any bones? At what age did she break a hip? And the failure to ask me those questions from the start also points, I think, to a de-skilling of doctors who rely routinely on that black box. 
My doctor didn't know what to do when the machine reported that I didn't fit, fit between its lines. And so, as a matter of governance as well, if, again, like the pancreas, if there is a mistake in the algorithms, it's very hard to know what to do about it. Who can correct it? A human doctor is now placed as the line of second opinion and actually is less likely to be thought of as mathematically accurate. Um, how does he or you even know if the al algorithms are subject to, uh, are, are accurate, um, if they are subject to laws of data privacy, not open to general review or comparison, and whose ethics are overseen um, when the primary obligation of the company that creates these algorithms is to corporate organization, that is to say, the health of the company, health is reputation and profit rather than is health of a given patient. And so the measure of my skeletal density or putatively hollow bones has a gatekeeper, an on-off switch, by which the probability of my having osteopenia becomes treated in the first instance as either null or certainty. And I mean, talk about crow epistemology. <laughs> my scan for signs of osteopenia or osteoporosis um, is subjected to these metrics for whether um, uh, you know, is, uh, is incorporated into the learned bias of gatekeeping, uh, of gates kept locked or unlocked. Um, this, this algorithm of osteoporosis calculating machine, this steering intelligence, reads me out of the possibility of osteoporosis when I'm interpreted as African American, not even self-identified as such, I, I would add, um, because no one asked me. <laughs> but apparently marked as such by my doctor or perhaps the intake nurse. Um, but it also contains the possibility of hollow, you know, th th this machine contains the possibility of hollow little bird bones if I am white. And, and so I, I think I call this part of the story um, <coughs> Schrodinger's cat without Pat. And against this backdrop, one measure being used in the very flawed program of the reason this matters to me. One metric being used in the very flawed program of family reunification is requiring asylum seekers to provide DNA to prove that they're related to the children who came in with them. And so this reductiveness of who I am or what I am um, is of uh, is, is pressing interest to me as a lawyer, um, you know, th this question of identity. Um, now, again, one wants perhaps to make sure that one's, the, the children that uh, uh, in this, this great mess we have at the southern border um, are with the people who love them um, and the question of belonging is, you know, I, I put to one side. One, but, but at the very least, one does not want to have people absconding with other people's children. But another part of what we must be worried about is the reductiveness of family to blood relation, to DNA identification, at a moment when citizenship itself is being redefined as something that can't be shared with, quote, other people's children, as Iowa Congressman Steve King has put it. We can't replenish our civilization with other people's children. So this is one more reason I found Elizabeth Warren's attempt to recoup her identity through DNA so problematic. <laughs> Um, and population genetist Carlos Bustamante's expression of her ancestor, his tr translation in that campaign ad that they made, um, as any kind of percentage of Native American is really troubling. It implies that there's 100% Native Americanness somewhere. That, in other words, it reinscribes a notion of racial purity that can then be fragmented among uh, individuals. More to be said, but beyond the pale of my talk today. But there is, nevertheless, this very interesting tension around essentialized, even nonsensical, political figurations of biology that strive for purity and for stasis. And this kind of thing has terrible implications, I think, for equal protection and for due process of law. Anyway, meanwhile, here I am, last night at Princeton. I'm so sorry I missed the dinner, but I was tucked up in my lovely room at the Nassau Inn, just exhausted, watching TV, and of course, it's Christmas season, and the spirit of gift giving as commerce pervades everything. And there are advertisements literally on every channel for 23andMe kits. Some advertise reconnection with families, some advertise reconnection with idiotic notions of culture. You know, 
I used to play the bagpipes. Now that I know who I am, who I am, that is, I have traded in my kilt for lederhosen. Okay. <laughs> but there was one last night that featured the Grinch, whose bitter closed heart has been expanded and opened after reading his animatronic DNA results with the magic of such a kid. And the Grinch's DNA apparently reveals that he, quote, may have trouble digesting dairy products because he's probably lactose intolerant since he winces at the first sight of holiday eggnog. <laughs> Moreover, his DNA reveals a love of salty snacks and even a weakness for gift giving. After all, despite himself, all while advocating the warmly emotive and cozily effective resonance of DNA kits as Christmas gifts, party favors, expressions of goodwill, good health, and redemptive good times. Are you ready to explore yours? Only $139 marked down from $199. Now, of course, this is part pure data grab, and it is part practice of making DNA symbolic, quasi-religious, and its power insuperable. Individual contract empowerment as bypassing medical protocol, clinical conventions, rendering irrelevant individual examination of actual bodies in deference to this proprietary, again meaning secret and therefore unchallenged, stochastic models of disease probability and disease prevention. But for me, let me lay out my concern with how language presents a real problem in all of this. Um, I think the last Sanf conversation that, uh, that Sanford and I had, uh, we were at a conference at least 10 years ago, I think, at which we spoke about what is contracted away with these kits, the supposedly anonymized data, family relation, the surveillance possibilities, the research, the development, the patent possibilities, with no guarantee of even attempted promise of distributive health benefits or accuracy of results, no relation to public health as opposed to hoarded wealth of tech giants. But this time, I want to speak to the even greater institutionalization of category mistakes, language that humans feed into the, uh, that humans in the lab, that is, feed into the machine, and that seem utterly resistant to social science insight um, and how it is creating separate worlds. Again, this is not a new thing, but perhaps harder to see because it's packaged like this advertisement, like that box, as generosity, openness, precision medicine, and expansive healing. So, um, this is the old technology, just the technology of, of, of vision. I, I, I have this little game I play with some of my students called fill in the caption. And I have these three pictures. And when I show them to my students just without caption, uh, my students see in this one a prayerful gesture, generally, or something like beseeching. Um, in this one, some see a sports event, but they see a, a reaching for something. There's actually a water bo bottle falling right at the upper edge of it. Um, uh, and, uh, and the same thing here. They see people reaching out. To get, but there's a certain, you know, there, there, there's, there's uh, in all of them, the reaching up of skinny arms has something like a beseeching or almost a prayerful sense of ready to receive. Um, then I fill in the caption, because these were taken from three different newspapers, but of the Haiti, this is in the wake of the Haiti earthquake. And this one is called Looter, this is called Looters, and this one is called Looters Looting a Grocery Store. And that's a box of rice traveling through the, through the, through the air. And so when you actually have the caption, and sometimes I show it in reverse, so I actually have the captions and they see that first. And what happens is that when, with the captions, <coughs> the human beings become devivified. I mean, it's the very captions leech the humanity out of the people that they're seeing, and instead it's, it gives voice to the thing being taken. The bottle of water is saying, help, help, help. The box of rice that is traveling through the air is saying, the entire property system is being undone, save me, save me. Um, and in that sense, it reverses the order of, um, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, there, there's a sense of contracted discourses. I asso associate those discourses as a lawyer with the way in which I was taught to think um, or, or to categorize this kind of language. Um, I think it's a semantic thing, but it's also buried in the structure of law. Contract uh, is what you see when that box of rights starts, starts uh, chattering away. But contract as a, as, a, as a structure is voluntarily undertake, undertaken. It is the language of consent. It is willfully calculated exchange value that is most important. It works best, best with fungible inanimate objects. 
and it commodifies the thing being transferred, and it suppresses its voice. Um, so when you have a looter, the the, the, the looter becomes the uh, subordinated. It's, it's, it, becomes a, 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 it becomes an interference with contract, um, not with human necessity, uh, with the workings of this marketplace. Um, Cost-benefit becomes the, 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 the dominant moral reference. Um, efficient breach, in which, which, in structured, which is structured in law to have few emotions, regrets, you pay your way in or out. Um, efficiency also in, brings a notion of speed, competitive advantage, hurry up and claim the right, the property right, which is defined as the right to exclude others. It is not a constitutional gaze when you start calling them looters and prioritize the subject, the legal subject, as the box of rice or the bottle of water. Um, because constitution talks about the constitutive, the relational, imposed obligations of respect, of restraint, not merely the pricelessness of constitution, pricelessness is part of what we think of as constitution, but the preciousness that is contained in that notion of pricelessness, um, of polity, of humanity, the web of life, something expansive, some, requiring something more, including a little more time. Things deemed so precious that they are given the equivalent of constitutional protection and thus come alive. They are animated by this discourse. They have a kind of voice, if not of language, they have prominence and priority and protection in the interconnectivity of relations. Now again, I don't want to superimpose American legal, uh, these formations upon um, uh, the, the kinds of very wonderful conversations we had thus far, but I want to talk about it as the point from which my discipline begins. Um, it is a very powerful construct uh, from which I have to move outward. Um, and so, in moving outward, I tend to think of moving through a series of concentric circles. Again, this is the way I was trained the in the first year of law school. Um, you have a kind of moral universe which begins the most private, the most discreet, the most individually individualized. Um, and it begins with homo economicus at the center of that circles, totally free, totally selfish, perfectly informed, work living in a vacuum with no transaction costs. I mean, that's, that's the way the individual uh, 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 libertarian homo economicus is framed, um, who, is then, who then engages in private agreements, which we call contract law, uh, somewhat broader moral scope, moral frame. That's why the, the, larger, the larger concentric circle here, <laughs> each of these indicates a, an enlarged moral framework, um, of assumed obligation, voluntary um, undertakings. Um, when you move to the body of tort, it's yet a larger moral framework in the sense that is, you know, if, if, if I don't sh uh, shovel my front doorstep, the law can come in and impose a limited remedy. It's not gonna be a crime, but it's going to uh, impose um, a community standard of a duty of care upon me. So you begin to move beyond simply what is assumed as in private contract into what is imposed as a social matter. And then the larger or the graver the intrusion upon a public geography or a communal space, the closer we come to criminal and then ultimately constitutional, which are imposed due to governing public ordering and public space. So these are the jurisprudential spheres of interest, and I will sort of skip over this fairly quickly, just go to the bottom. Each of these is sort of like almost an Aristotelian one, two, three, four, you know, uh, the Comissian sense of accumulation of moral weight. Um, and what is not considered in American law at any rate <laughs> um, is the world beyond that, um, which may include, for example, human rights. So we've had Supreme Court justices who've said that human rights are foreign law. Um, but <laughs> international and human rights law, the value in dignity, dignity is not particularly included in American jurisprudence, integrity of the body. Um, and then beyond that, ecological concerns, non-human centered ontologies, the value of environmental or planetary or vocabularies or discourses that go beyond this um, um, are obviously the, 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 you know, what where we have much work to do. So in applying this kind of hierarchy, you know, in law, we, we, the, the narrowest range is the personal, the next is the social relational, and then the realm of public interest, 
What I see happening in today's world, and particularly aided by the kinds of technology to which I'm going to refer a little bit later, is a sense of that private contract, personal, uh, free of all transaction costs assumption of a legal subject or a legal actor, human or non-human, it doesn't matter. Um, that discourse, that vocabulary, that frame, that semantic, that grammar, that syntax, completely taking over the language or a constitutional discourse um, that we used to have as a, as, as, as a resource, um, as a way of framing in, uh, that, that comes from these, from these larger uh, moral dimensions. So again, to give you another quick example, this is a case that you might have seen a few years ago this is from the news, the local newspaper in Obion County, Tennessee. Imagine your home catches fire, but the local fire department won't respond, then watches it burn. That's exactly what happened to a local family tonight. A local neighborhood is furious after firefighters watched as an Obion County, Tennessee home burned to the ground. The homeowner, Jim Cranick, said he offered to pay whatever it would take for firefighters to put out the flames, but was told it was too late. They wouldn't do anything to stop his house from burning. Each year, Obion County residents must pay $75 if they want fire protection from the city of South Fulton. But the Cranicks did not pay. The mayor said that if the homeowners don't pay, they're out of luck. The, this fire went on for hours because garden hoses just wouldn't put it out, and it wasn't until that fire spread to a neighbor's property that anybody would respond. Turns out the neighborhood, the neighbor had paid the fee I thought they'd come it out and put it out even if you hadn't paid your $75, but I was wrong, said Jean Cranick. So everybody blamed Jean Cranick. Um, that this, who was an elderly wheelchair-bound man who forgot to pay the $75, he volunteered to pay whatever it would cost to put out the fire. Um, he would repay the city. Um, uh, the house caught on fire, it killed his pets, it destroyed his field, all his other possessions. Um, and uh, the fire, and, and, and in a market discourse, note what happened to the fire. I mean, how the fire was configured. Um, the fire was configured as bounded, as a consequence that could contain to the decision making rationalities of a single actor, and payment became the central mor moral value. And in fact, Glenn Beck um, became famous um, for saying, compassion, compassion, compassion. He was talking about this case, compassion, compassion. It's the $75. You, you know, he doesn't understand that he should have paid the $75. That's what mattered most in that cont contractarian moral universe. From a constitutional perspective, most of those of us who live in the rest, uh, places outside of the South, this is not a, the pay to spray, as it's called, is not a common uh, arrangement for fire departments precisely because we recognize that fire is a force that breaks through fences and leaps across walls. It does not obey the logic of property bounds or monetary expenditure. It is therefore a shared threat, a public harm whose potential for ignoring human boundaries poses risks. We pool our resources for the collective good and public health and safety emerge as more central moral values. Um, but again, if the only thing you're worried about is Gene Cranick's house and not the larger concerns about where fire may wander, um, it has, it, it reflects a certain logic. But it is also reflects, and I, I, I mentioned that you don't see this very many places, and the reason you don't see this for, is very many places is that it's not just a geographic mapping, it's also an historically raced one. Gene Cranick was actually a white man, a poor white man living in a rural area of Tennessee that used to be a black area. And so during the times of, uh, you know, of, of, well, still, <laughs> I shouldn't put this in the past, <laughs> but basically he was living in an area that was not serviced by water lines, sewer lines, and all of the rest um, because it, these were the black areas, and so the, the city ended. And so you had to buy back into the system if you wanted, on an individual level, if you wanted these protections. Um, and therefore, actuarially, I mean, he sort of existed as this actuarial uh, figure um, as a white black man. Um, now, Donald Trump also proceeds, um, when he was talking about recent forest fires, you didn't manage your money right, no more funding for you, no more help, let it burn, let it burn. <laughs> it's your own damn fault, California's fault, your fault, your liability, no larger cost to be considered. Disaggregated from a larger constitutiveness, um, ecological or otherwise. He, similarly, when he withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, you've, his language was completely monetized, beholden to exchange value, competitiveness 
as against other economies to the point of silliness. Um, empirically questionable comparatives, questionable hierarchies, as in the United States is the cleanest and most economically friendly country on earth. Now, this is factually false, and you know we can criticize him as a politician, as somebody who represents our Constitution and the collective, but as contract, there's nothing wrong with lying in a contract or having something that is, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. There is something wrong about lying in a contract. But if you have an empirically false relation as part of the equation in a contract, it really doesn't matter because contract permits the will of the individual transactors. You can ha have private meanings rather than sound price or community relations um, as the metric. And therefore, if you choose to value an old cigarette butt at a million dollars and you can find somebody who's willing to pay that, the rest of the world should just butt out, so to speak. And if you find somebody willing to sell you a five carat diamond ring for $50, well, lucky you. And so this is a narrowly exclusive, go it alone, go it alone either or, or kind of world view. So, um, uh, this is, you know, the same logic that Flint's water, that poisoned Flint's water. Um, and so my goal in making this clear is to examine concepts of agency, action, and freedom, to dissipate habitual binaries, and to create a better account of the contributions, effects of non-human forces like fire by creating an aesthetic effect of openness to material vitality, to rethink law and politics as ecological, and publics as human, non-human collectives that are provoked into existence by a shared experience of harm. And so how do we craft frames of reference that enlarge our sense of shared destiny in the face of a looming collective disaster, um, whether it's the fate of those children on the border um, or whether it is climate change? Is there a gesturing toward different configurations of embodiment or biospheres in which all vitality is embedded so we can find buried in the figurations provided by different discourses? What differing outcomes, in other words, when we imagine ourselves through the lens of homo economicus, as in me first, America, doing business as, a, you know, as an ultra-libertarian, uh, versus a corporate person, versus oneself or ourselves as citizen subjects, versus we the people, versus brother rabbit, sister water, mother earth, or father sky. Um, and so rhetorical conventions of market as opposed to constitution are ones that limit or direct ethical and moral considerations in one direction or another. So my question in all of this is how it helps me understand the cases and controversies with which I work. And this is not just about biology, it's also about syntax, the control of looking and whether one is located in the singular or the plural, the static or the motile, on top or repressed. Let me give you a, a, a little bit more complicated example of what I'm talking about um, on my way to the question of syntax. Um, so the profitably biologized question, question of citizenship that I mentioned in terms of these children at the border and whether or not they have to take DNA tests to be reunited with their parents. Um, we have this problem already in the context of surrogacy and breeding contracts and so-called surrogacy tourism. Um, and Professor Yasmin er Ergas at uh, Columbia has written about one sort of configuration in resolving these litigations. And it's called the straight through theory of parental rights. What happens when you have a child who is conceived by virtue of a Danish egg, a, uh, um, a Spanish sperm uh, with, uh, uh, in, and, and, and gestationally carried by in, in, in a dorm in India by, 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 by a woman in India. Um, the genetic carrier is in India. Um, and so these children, if, 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 if the, uh, you know, if the contracting parties are American citizens, for example, even though the child is born in India, uh, they are by and large now given American citizenship. This is, this is actually beginning to be a little bit re-examined in the wake of some of what's going on right now. But that configuration privileges genetic, not really full biological connection, right? Um, ownership, if not personhood, or life is figured as the beginning of conception, um, which is not what we 
usually think of in liberal academic circles of the beginning of life or, or the beginning of the, of, 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 you know, the, when we, you know, there's a certain bristling at pre-born life of that term. But in this context, it's at the front of the debate. And it treats the woman who is the gestational carrier as incidental, as fetal hotel or uterine warehouse, as it's called, and, and these are judges writing this, <laughs> a kind of factory or production site. Um, uh, and, and I quote a, a one judge, we won't need women soon anyway, and, I, and, and, and we, we can grow ears on the back of a mouse. Soon children will be gestated in labs. Stop romanticizing women's attachments. So it treats the babies as product and property as passing through the body. That's the passing through, <laughs> um, passing straight through. And so parental rights in the bearer or gestator are terminated by private commission rationalized by exchange value. It's a contract relationship. This is entirely, or, or competes entirely with the conceptualization of the female body in abortion, which is woman's choice, prerogative, freedom, right, based on autonomy, integrity of the gestational body, uh, and notions of privacy. And so gamete, blastocyst, embryo, fetus is not a person in that configuration, and most jurisdictions have not yet made fetuses full persons in the eye of the law, in particular the 14th Amendment, which again is, is part of what is being attacked by Trump and others in this configuration of citizenship. So some wombs, particularly those of black, poor, and nasty women, <laughs> are viewed as ungoverned and ungovernable, dangerous, fetus devouring, baby killing, even genocidal, contaminated in need of regulation, purification, ultimate abstinence, or sterilization. And then you have adoption, the model of adoption, and the decision to terminate rights is never final until after the birth in recognition of the fact that bonding may occur whether one signs a contract or not. Um, and commissioning of intended parent is interrogated based on metrics centered on the child's best interests. And adoption is often viewed as uplift across race, class, culture, a ladder of opportunity climbed, filled with potential, and this is less so when certain inflections of race are added in, where a baby comes from a contaminated, impure womb, the baby becomes literally a charity case, not family, but, quote, just like family. Um, but again, notice this progression of names of the egg, a little bit like Homo of, uh, economicus all the way up to, 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 to full citizen. We have fruit of the room, fruit of the womb, gift, infinite potential at one end. Um, then altruism, sacrifice, charity, or potlatch. <laughs> then non-agentic object, incapacitated potential product, the use value, um, the, and the price put on uh, the, the, the gestational manufacture of, of, surrogate ch of, of surrogately produced children, or ART. Um, and then commodity exchange value, ultimately. Uh, this also, not just the name of the, ch of, the, of the thing produced, but of the name of the womb, the name of the room, the name of sometimes the tomb, the, the, this, this non-biological geography referred to as warehouse, rental space, warming oven. Um, oh, okay. Um, and, and the concern is that this produces a kind of viviparity um, that, that this, uh, that, that, uh, that, that this uh, uh, configuration uh, uh, is really changing the nature of, of how we think of childbirth itself. So that viviparity, which biologically is, the, is reproducing through live birth, or the development of an embryo inside the body of a parent, um, is being replaced by a notion of human reproduction as non-viviparity, which refers to reproduction by laying eggs so that reproduction is completed by incubation outside the parental body, like chicken or flies. So in some ways, surrogacy is introducing a model of non-viviparity, redefining our, our sense of um, who we are. Okay, I have only four minutes to run through the syntactical part, um, but I am concerned that, in fact, there is a kind of grammatical gender at work, there's a genderizing at work. And I don't mean this in terms of male or female, but in terms of the way in which the language of um, market all the way through constitution and beyond um, is bendered, is, 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 
reflective of a grammatical gender. So in English, we don't have genders outside of pronouns like he and she, or a few nouns like waiter and waitress, actor and actress, or modes of address like Mr. and Mrs. But we do have subtler kinds of gender built into American or British English or Australian culture inflections. And uh, I, uh, I think I'm going to skip a little bit of this, but to to really focus on the fact that my concern is what gets animated and what doesn't, and what gets invisibly gendered as female or uh, male or female, um, in the sense that we associate male and female with a certain kind of animation. So there are more kinds of genders if we think of gender as genre or type or an assortment. So masculine tends to be a verb used as a noun. Feminine tends to be a word used as the result of executing a verb. Non-human, alive, animal, or animated is another perhaps kind of gender in this sense of what I mean. Non-human, not alive, but inhabited like the immortality of a corporate body or the vivacity of water given personhood in New Zealand, for example, might be another kind of gender that we could give you know, uh, that, uh, the meaning of gender. Or neuter, empty thing, uh, empty entity. Um, I think of this in the context of the way in which we talk about DNA, CRISPR, gametic, citizenship, uh, that uh, I, I listen to people talking about I am my genes, um, the way in which DNA becomes its own kind of legal or grammatical subjectivity and the driver of a verb um, in which the active the activity of DNA becomes a kind of active verb as an expressing, and I mean this very specifically so that there's actually work in the, in the FDA to make gene expression a kind of First Amendment protected expressivity as like, like part of the Bill of Rights, that genes have a right which actually redounds not to the DNA or the expression of, 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 of genes, but to the lab, which is a kind of libertarian way of giving that right of, ex of experimentation and play, as in CRISPR experimentation, to labs without any liability. Um, but it, it seems to me it's a syntactical way of su superimposing this in, into the, into, uh, onto, in, in form of, uh, uh, genetic expression. A verb used as a noun, agentic, noun as a verb having been executed, the expression, the deination. And so if gender is related to status and motility and motion, then it is also related to time, to order, to chronology, to tense. Um, and if, and so this is, this is, do I have two minutes to just lay this out? And, okay. Um, so, Pardon me? Okay, I, I just, I, I, I'm really close to the end. So, so my concern is that you know, we are, we're talking in a land of invisible gerunds and gerundives and, uh, and, and, and we're putting these into legal uh, and, and, and very directive forms. Um, even if they're not in the formal law, they are in the structures um, that are guiding our lives like law, if, if it's co even if it's code. And so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to sort of map is this kind of uh, grammatical activity. So a gerund, um, if the masculine is underwritten by a verb that functions as a noun, it overlaps with the definition of a gerund, an ing noun related to an infinitive. Playing is pleasure. To play is pleasure. The gerundive, which we don't really have in English, you have in Portuguese, if you, you know, but the gerundive is a verb that functions as an adjective, bringing a kind of transitivity to the object that ends up in a formation that implies obligation, a mustness, a need. And if the feminine is associated with the result of executing a verb, a having done something, a process in motion, then maybe the gerundive is implicated even if we don't have it as a clearly decipherable matter in English. But it's important because it's a construction of obligation, of mustness, of readiness, and ripeness, a to-be-doneness, a grammatical neediness that must be met and fed, a future participle that, while passive, drives a sense of the necessary, a mountain to be climbed, a message to be spread. I think propaganda is the only real English gerundive we have. It's the feminine gerundive of propagare in Latin. Um, of that which must, should, ought to be propagated, spread, and disseminated. And so when you think about that as the backdrop, think of this statement by Jenny Reardon, uh, the, in her book, The Postgenomic Condition. Then Chancellor of USCF, US, UCSF and former president of the product development at Genentech called for a, quote, new social contract in which individuals will not expect privacy but rather the opportunity to share their clin personal, personal clinical 
data. And that's, that's the kind of gerundive, semantic urgency, I think, that comes from a kind of market uh, system of reference, but that is expressed or sends up red flags. When I see this kind of use of a certain kind of grammar in the context of what must be done, um, over, overstepping the bounds of what legally we express as privacy, um, I'm worried. So, uh, you know, I see this emerging in a lot of, to, to defeat a lot of what we thought of as the, you know, perhaps too formal uh, concentric circles of law. Um, but I think it is a feature not just of English grammar or Romance languages or whatever language, but a feature of genderized and racialized grammar. The imagined super predator poised for slaughter, the lambs ready for slaughter is a kind of so that sense of about to happen. The Mexican prone to raping, the reflexively terrifying terrorist, the migrant as one exists in a forward motion of perpetual obligation to be quarantined, segregated, expelled, and exterminated, the command or necessity for activity against or about a grammatical object or purpose built into or folded back into the passive status of the noun or the nominal he needed killing. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm also very concerned about the elimination of the subjunctive as a space of constitutional discourse. Um, and instead, we have this weird kind of um, predictive risk brought into the present and fixed in uh, certainly, and, and with the assistance of certain technology. Um, and uh, I just want to say, I think that brings one to the question of what is happening with uh, things like the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the struggle for the right to be forgotten. Um, that you have presently a lot of tension in law uh, based on the, the law being uh, balanced by some notion of justice. And justice, it seems to me, is uh, infused with a kind of mercy that has a tense to it, um, which is that it is not always fixed in the past. It's not always fixed in the present, but it is as it ought to be. Um, there's a kind of oughtness or shouldness, a kind of subjunctive possibility um, to it. And when you put things in, into a machine that never forgets, the permanence or easy retrievability or non-retractability or legibility of an expunged court record is a kind of mercy, for example. Um, and so I'm in discussion with students who want to deploy blockchain to this end to anonymize uh, records and so forth. But, it, it, but the pro basic problem we're dealing with is the heart of what we see as justice or fairness. What is the letter of the law if the, you know, the letter of the law works, the strict interpretation of law works if the penalty isn't death, for example, or if it isn't uh, being penned up in a, in, a, in a tent in the desert forever for the rest of your life without parents. And the role of justice is to buffer in cases where some grand consequence, including death, requires some measure or pause, some mercy. Um, and the difference between law and equity is the difference between this as a static place, what was and always shall be, that tension of tense, or the mercy of what ought to be the space of the subjunctive, the ethical, the conditional, the time taken for considering what should be. And this is another meaning of due process. And due process is beyond pricing. It is conceptually distinct from a contract remedy, which is, to go back to the fire case, all about the $75 of the pecuniary equation, the exchange value, um, rather than um, the, uh, the multiple senses of possibility and contingency um, that exist simultaneously um, for us to be enacted as we imagine our constitutiveness, our, our ultimate constitutiveness. I'm shocked. You did a great job. I am completely shocked That'll to live in a country. No, it's worse than I ever thought. It's worse than I ever thought. I want to ask you one question, though. Um, is there a de Tocquevillian summary that might help make intelligible the particular way in which, because I mean, law is historical, right? 
I mean, it, I mean, what I mean is the foundations go back. I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know anything about. I'm not. Connect, I'm not American, so there's a lot I don't know about anything around this. But where? But this know, is Anglo-American. I mean, you're Canadian. Well, you're okay. I mean, it's, okay. It's not that different. Yeah. Well, I don't know. The way laws get written, perhaps, are different in in, in, yeah. in Canada. But the question is: Is there a De Tocquevillian summary that explains to us why um, anglo america let's say Anglo law? Um, has the particular limitations and scope uh, that it has taken on in which those things that were called foreign or European, et cetera, uh, don't figure in terms of protections, in terms of how they conceive of protections, et cetera, et cetera. You had that, it was an early slide that you mm -hmm. had, and I just wondered, like, what accounts for that? Um, is it, is there a, a glib summary of what it is about you know, is there some foundation in? I, I don't think it's that different in Canada. I mean, I don't think it's that well, different that's what in, I'm asking. in British no, no. law. Oh. There's, I think, the, the distinction I was making, and I, I do think it's it's somewhat different for European configurations. There's certainly much more marked differences in um, in other forms of jurisprudence. But throughout the colonial British Empire. This is not that different, um, and, it's, and it's as old as Blackstone commentaries, or to some to some to some parts of the property regime is, you know, the Magna Carta. Um, I mean, we have a peculiar emphasis in the United States on the language of contract governing human bodies, which I think is the persistence, the longer persistence of slavery in the American context. But again, the British context or the Canadian context is not free from that either. Uh, it's, it's, I think it is a fair point that it's much more marked in the American context. Well, I, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, I wasn't contrasting the Canadian. I mean, for example, I was recently in uh, Europe. I mentioned this to you the other day, and uh, everybody told me, well, Fox News, it's illegal here. Yeah. Um, and I said, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and they said, yes. And somebody explained to me, somebody leaned over, somebody who knew something about it, and told me that uh, Murdoch had somehow managed 20 years ago to remove the, uh, whatever the criterion were for what is considered truth in news mm -hmm. telling at some point, which paved the way and cleared the way that they can still call themselves news, whereas at places in Germany, uh, for, for example, in Germany, um, it simply doesn't meet those criteria, and therefore they're not allowed to broadcast. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, what? I'm just wondering, there's some s essential differences in conception of what a legal body is, or what, you know, is there a different ultimate philosophy that you could. And also, just, what exists in the constitutional s space? I mean, that I, I, I hate to be so is it usually flat about this, but yeah, but. but in, yes, and that 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 media is something which is political. It is shared. It can, it's a conversation that's public. Therefore, it's constitutive. We used to think about it that way. I remember Newt Minow's famous uh, uh, "TV is a vast wasteland" was really part of a conversation about how the FCC ought to uh, monitor and have a fair what was a fair response. It was fair political response. There was a time in our in our regulatory scheme in the United States when, you know, if a politician said something, that, that there would be a chance for the opposite to be heard because it was part of a public conversation. We've largely abandoned that, not just as to television, um, but, uh, you know, on the, uh, you know, the, the abandonment of, of net neutrality, as my colleague Tim Wu has nicknamed it. Um, and so everything is priced and everything is competitive and uh, the only, as Fox News says in the United States, my, our only ethical guideline is the First Amendment. And the First Amendment means that you can lie. I mean, you can basically lie unless you're, unless you're posing an imminent threat. Um, in most other countries of the world, this sounds like nonsense. Um, but here it sounds like freedom of expression. I mean, we've taken freedom of expression. That's because the First Amendment, I think, is so identified as an ultimate freedom um, that uh, as, as opposed to Europe, for example, where the concept of privacy is very related to the question of dignity. And dignity is lodged in the public sphere. It's, it's relational. It's the sense of a, a certain kind of human regard for one another. Whereas privacy is like, I can just, you know, I can do whatever I want within my little uh, bubble world. And so 
you know, we think we're talking about the same thing when we talk about privacy and even use the word dignity in the American context, but legally it leads to very different um, results in terms of the regulation of that kind of public conversation. Um, so that's, you know, but again, we did, we used to have something like <laughs> a concept of regulation of newspaper, television, and so forth, and you see it still, that's why we call broadsheets, respectable media broadsheets. They have codes of ethics, they're written, but the BBC, for example, by way of contrast, has a book this thick of ethical guidelines of the communities to which they have responsibility, what they have to do, not just how to fact check, but who they have to talk to in, uh, in terms of representing various communities. Um, very little of our media has that, even the best. Um, I, I, the first thing I want to say is that I, I, that's kind of reverberating yesterday's motif around how big is an atom that with what you presented as far as this kind of Niels Bohr diagram of the, the legal you know, concept, that, that there's a kind of personal, and, and it seems like there's this question of how big is the personal. Um, and and when, you're, when I think about both the talks in terms of reading, it seems like you're asking us to read syntax. And, and, and Sanford, you were asking us to read the organic matter of mind and other kinds of matter in some ways. And, and I guess I want to ask both of you about stories and reading stories. Um, with Sanford, with, with yours, you brought up Whitehead in, in this kind of event, and I wonder about putting somebody like Sylvia Winter in dialogue with what you're doing, like the, the relationship between the event and the story. You know, Sylvia Winter says that the storytelling is the kind of the, the sort of the third major event. There's the beginning of the universe, there's the beginning of organic life, and then there's the beginning of storytelling. And that storytelling is as significant as those other two. Um, and, and, and I wonder with, um, with this idea of kind of, you know, maybe the how big is the personal in, in relationship to the syntax, um, I, I wonder, is there a, a realm for reading stories? I'm struck that Octavia Butler, you know, already kind of projected the world that you're describing to us, right? And even with this kind of paying for the firefighters, um, you know, I, I mean, you're, you're obviously working with stories all the time, but, but can you talk to us also about the relationship between storytelling and syntax, I guess, the kind of syntax that you're asking us to read? Yeah, I mean, perhaps the most familiar one for anybody who's not in laws is whether, you know, is, is corporate personhood. Um, you know, it's, it's a vivification, that's what I mean, that, that it, it, it and, and, and when you, I'm sorry, when you look at some of the decisions, and I don't have them in front of me, you will see this use of the gerundive as an invisible force in how, um, of, of the kind of what, what, what um, you know, uh, Felix Cohen, a uh, jurisprudent from the 1920s, called it um, uh, transcendental nonsense. But it really, it, it, but, it, but it is a form of story. It, it's no longer nonsense to us who live in the legal world. Um, it is a story told about how to inspire, how to breathe, you know, uh, you know how, how to make a corporation come alive, and how it, it becomes the immortal expression of a certain kind of uh, personified business interest. So, yeah, I think you know Octavia Butler is absolutely apt in, the, in terms of what we do every day in law. I mean, law is nothing if not performative. We are always, uh, you know, in, in it's you know some have called it theaters of justice. I mean, it, it is uh, you know it's, it's why I love. I mean, in terms of aligning Sylvia Winter with what happens in the law, I think of Shoshana Feldman's description of trauma. Um, and you know, there's a, there is an event of the trauma, and then there is uh, you know, the, the, the born witness of it, and, the, um, and then the, and, 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 or, or the silence, the inability to speak, you know, and how that silence has its own uh, communicative power. Uh, but, but, but narrativity is at the center of what she, she, she has a book called Testimony, colon, Crises of Witnessing. Um, and it seems to me this is, it's very important to think of, I mean, it, it, it's very helpful to think of it in those terms, I think. If I had, so, if I had anything to uh, respond to that, I, I would say that uh, well, I feel compelled to make a small response that the first day, uh, I don't know if you were here, Mitch, but uh, there was uh, quite a bit of uh, singing about the glories of storytelling, and um, they were glorious. Um, the storytelling we were discussing was really social storytelling, and we understood that the power of story, of telling, of stories, was a, the creation of a, 
um, temporary, shall we say, uh, community, um, even if it was just a kind of a, a neurological community or a kind of a, a, an exper a shared experience. However, uh, I was trained, uh, for better or worse, when I was, you know, um, in um, you know, studying literature, that, or at least this is a, 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 a commitment that I had, that every story was a cosmos. And um, the trick, uh, or rather the, um, the task, was to essentially describe the cosmos that created that story. Uh, in the, in the full cosmology sense. Um, and it shapes, it really shapes world and world shapes us, et cetera. And it strikes me that I would share, I think with Raviv, some of the caution um, about storytelling as a panacea. Um, we are living right now in a world where um, any story is a good enough story and every story has its uh, adherents, uh, its defenders, uh, regardless of whether they're true or not, they're simply stories and they organize a universe for people. They tell us who's good, who's bad, what's good and what's bad, um, and they're very charismatic. And storytelling's charisma is problematic. Um, all charismatic social effects are dangerous and fascinating, but dangerous because fascinating. So I just would throw in my caution about storytelling as uh, anything more than perhaps uh, an enhancement, if you like, for other forms of um, production, shall we say, of um, knowledge or social, uh, social world, social existence. Can I, can I just add, I, I certainly, and I don't recall hearing anybody advance storytelling as a panacea, and 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 my concern is not to advance storytelling. Or remedy? And I don't, Would it yeah. be okay to say remedy? No, I I certainly don't view it as a remedy. No, I mean I I, I see it as a as. Uh, I would say it's a dangerous a, necessity. I mean, or to to know the story you're telling. I mean, it is a little bit like what the Grinch is doing. I mean, it, to to watch how it is operating, but that's why for me I prefer to think of it as you know, that there are grammatical rules of arrangement and when one looks at uh, what goes into the construction of a story, that's the important part. Um, and uh, that's why I like the image of law as a series of strokes or a series of interventions at particular times. It tells you when to put out the fire, when not to put out the fire. It's a series of switches or, you know, you can, there are, I suppose there are other kinds of analogies <laughs> one could use, but I don't think that, uh, I mean, storytelling is more or less persuasive depending upon how good the choreography is. But it is, for me, a kind of, choreographed set of signals of that, that tell people what to do when and how um, and sometimes you know it's like jump rope you know if you if you go in at the right time it's great and if you if you miss a step um, that story can mean that you end up you know in a jumble of rope and 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 mess and and so that's so, so knowing the pace <laughs> perhaps is so there's another is kind of story of, a song yeah. a song is a story it has a lot of the qualities yeah. of a um, uh, of a story. As you were speaking, it struck me that one kind of extraordinary story um, that I used to be interested in were the cartographic stories such as the Aboriginal song lines, uh, where in some weird way that I suppose is incompletely understood, um, it represents uh, pathways uh, for negotiation. And um, through the, I mean, you know, when they go walk about they cross virtually the entire uh, continent, it is said that the songs lead them and help them anticipate the geographical features, et cetera, that are uh, going to be encountered. Uh, you, you could say that, you know, that might be a kind of revivification, perhaps, of aspects of stories and storytelling that are lost um, and that may be uh, different ways of well, and And I, I don't disagree with that, but I also, I like to hear that as a kind of, you know, for me right now, what I am thinking about is, again, not just that it's a story, but that it's also uh, that, that myths operate as a kind of um, uh, tense. Um, so you know, there's a, what, what, what I think of is that there's a the, the, one of uh, 
I was reading an article recently about Siberian bear hunting, and when they go out, they, they sing, and they sing these long songs about the history of Siberian bears and how they should be killed. And there are stories of how to treat the bear and how carefully to handle the body, and, 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 and it's a kind of griot tradition of, of, of interrelation with nature. Um, and then an anthropologist went in and noticed that they, you know, they, they actually don't do that. They, they devour the bear, they discard the carcass, you know, that's terrible. Um, but that the song represents a kind of subjunctive what ought to be, and they carry that within the, you know. And so for me, it's, it's again about the grammar of, you know, it's, it's, it's um, it, it is about where you place it about where you place it. And, 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 and so I listen to, you know, our, you know, is there anything like the Siberian bear song in our American mm -hmm. music? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it feels like because, and that, that's a larger point here, we've eliminated something of the subjunctive space. Um, the, uh, you know, we don't even have that aspiration of the way it should be done. We just do it, and so we end up with that gameskeeper who killed the entire family of baboons and has a picture with it because he can't imagine any other, because it's, we've lost a kind of imaginative space and we've taken all of, and, and, and there's also a, a way in which that propagandistic sense of urgency of a consumptive contractarian state means that you have to eliminate all um, all threat, all risk, in the present, and you know, it's it's there's this comprehensive sense of needing to uh, not just prepare for future events, but to treat those future events as though they're existing now, and uh, and and eliminate them. And it seems to me that that's a that's a deadly, deadly kind of necrophiliac grammatical state, not just a story we're telling ourselves. So these, that's that's what. All right. Um, yeah, I would just like to interject really shortly uh, uh, a recent paper that was published, I think, two weeks ago, to take it into the pre-literate, uh, and I don't know if you could say pre-lawful, probably laws go beyond uh, when they started to be written down, but there was recently a find in Kalimatan in, in Borneo of the, mo the oldest uh, inscriptions of figurative uh, imagery, we won't, I won't call it art, which decenters the European narrative. Uh, predates to around 45,000 to 50,000 of uh, the dates of the first uh, cave drawings. And it's in a location which is very difficult to get to, which means that it was an effort. It's not places that people were living. And it's very similar to the drawings that were done in Europe uh, several thousand years later, so 45,000 to 50,000 years ago. And this is, this is a recent they were, discovery. They were hunter-gatherer. Hunter hunter-gatherer, um, hunter -gatherer, and we're talking about um, the, the article that was written by the uh, archaeologists in Indonesia. Uh, look at the period in time that they were made, and it re it's about the peak of the Ice Age, which means that there are land passages, so there can be some sort of communication over larger-scale Eurasia. But what it suggests in the paper is that this is a moment of grave danger, ecological danger, that actually demands a kind of rallying. And at that moment, the storiological is invented. So there's an invention of, uh, and I won't call it art or culture, because I think it's techniques, human techniques, that I think was essential in the pre-literate, in, pre uh, in our ancestry, but that we've, we've forgotten in, in the way that Jane said, uh, sort of this necessary evil so that we can't escape it, but let's get into it with the knowledge that we're, we're committing a kind of, not a sin, but we're, we're, we're being enchanted while not being enchanted at the same time, having one foot in or one foot out. I don't know if that's a possibility. But it seems to be something, what I'm trying to say is that it's not evolutionary, but we've carried over certain aspects that seem to be traits in, in, in the types of things that, that the humans have done, uh, that we've forgotten the implications and the possibilities of it, and we, we're sort of being seduced ourselves into things that we're not knowing that we're seducing ourselves into, and then we create worlds that we don't know we've created. And the grammatical, I think, is a great example in terms of not even the story, but just how you organize the language already implicates entities, defines boundaries. So in fact, you're saying that a different grammar, we don't need to redefine entities, we need to find the grammar in order to allow for the fluidity, if I understand correctly. Stories and figuring of that kind are <clears throat> typically seen as 
forms of soothing. Um, sometimes healing, they're usually parts of rituals, uh, religious, spiritual, but almost always medical. Um, when you say they're very remote, it's clear that people um, put in great effort and made great effort to get to those places, largely because they were probably sacramental. Uh, 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 in fact, I mean, I read a lot about stuff on cave art, and there are no real good, firm um, uh, explanations, but it's pretty much widely agreed that they must have been sacramental. Um, and uh, it makes sense that, uh, that, those, uh, that those places were, in fact, remote and made special. Even, you know, African, um, um, e even African masks, which, of course, not just for the face, but the whole, those things are usually brought out only for a few minutes a year. Uh, and nobody gets to see them very long. They're supposed to be infused with incredible, you know, with magic power that they get seen as a flash, et cetera, and, get, and they get immediately ushered away. Um, I don't know what you're saying in terms of what that might mean. I mean, the idea that because those are the earliest ones found, that those are suddenly the very first. It wasn't the birth, shall we say, but it's just a, a I would say, you know, in a way, it's a, a human uh, uh, need, if you like, to uh, create order and um, communicate with the forces that were uh, terrifying forces, basically. And it's a kind of an accommodation, a form of... Uh, um, well, it's a form of, I suppose, uh, domesticating contact with forces that can't be mastered. Um, my question is uh, for Patricia. And um, what I heard you do really beautifully was make me pay attention to the syntax of what in my world would be called the syntax of neoliberalism. So there's a neoliberal law, and here's the syntax of it. Um, and it, one of its defining traits is it, it really either lacks or underplays the, the subjunctive, so the should. But, um, and then I'm thinking, but now there seems to be, a, recently one could say that another kind of discourse, um, a fa more fascist discourse, is in the process of sort of forming an unholy alliance with this neoliberal discourse, and which has a different you know, there's a lot of shoulds in, in, you know, make America great again, we should do this, we should get rid of, you know, dirty, dirty invaders at the southern border, et cetera. So that's making me think that I wonder when that kind of discourse, that kind of syntax is going to start showing up in the law and whether you had any thoughts about, about that. Yeah. That, that is, you know, and I didn't have time to go into that, and one of it, you know, is, is the concern in which there are many subjunctives. <laughs> And so one of the concerns I have is the way in which law is using algorithmic predictive models to take possibilities in the future and not just say this could happen. This is not just risk assessment anymore. It takes those risks and puts them in the present and says now we're going to confine you by that. And that's the gesture that worries me that's, that, that is fascistic, you know, that you are a type or a probability, and we treat that probability as a certainty in the present. So it's a, it's a disordering of, of, of time or a misuse, I think, of probability, but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's probably best captured by Donald Trump Jr.'s tweet where he had a big bowl of, 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 of Skittles, yeah, uh, yeah. This piece is called the Phenomenology of Skittles, actually, <laughs> and he says, and he says, you know, um, uh, th this is a big bowl of Skittles and it looks delicious. You know, imagine that three of them are poisoned. Now would you take a big handful? That's our immigration problem, right? Okay, so it 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 makes that sort of palpable and present, and it takes this, uh, and, and it, it it takes something we. Th think of as a probability which, which might, even if it were true, if, you know, if it were empirically verified, um, be something we would want to <coughs> install cautionary measures about, but not necessarily throw the whole bowl, bowl of Skittles out, and particularly if those Skittles are humans. They're not, you know, that they <coughs> are actually. But, and so that, that, um, that, that seems to me the, the it's, 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 it's an arrangement design. of time. Yeah, it's an arrangement of time. It's also a kind of leaping over or to suppression of certain aspects of certain kinds of the, of the, particularly the subjunctive that we use most frequently in English, but imagine that, you know, 
So that's that's what it will be interesting to see how those two syntaxes coexist in law come to coexist in law because I don't think they mesh well. But I mean, they might. I think politically, it's easy to mesh together things that don't go together. But maybe maybe in the law, it's easy to do that too. I don't know. No, yeah. I think that they, yeah. dis they you know they grow and they disguise each other. Yeah, they're, they're, it's very and I and that's why I think that Trump is not dumb at all. Some of yeah. what he says is so. Uh, Neatly within this kind yeah, of, yeah. Uh, you know, d d linguistic. Yeah, uh, he has like a, an intuition I, I for it. Yeah, it's not accidental. Um, it's hypnotic, actually. So, I mean, that the, the, and if hypnosis itself plants these kinds of suggestions and then arranges them in temporal relations. That you know, that's that's what I worry about. Um, maybe one more. This one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, um, so I don't have a formalized question, but I was thinking amongst I think across some of the conversations that were happening, and I saw some connections certainly between um, some of the co-emerging relationships between these. Uh, talks and last night between uh, Karen and Daniela actually um, because I was thinking of on one hand we have uh, this idea of sort of salience or kind of emergence of something um, in particular the way that Sanford you mentioned how um, or diffraction actually salience and diffraction seem to have a lot to do with each other in the sense that in the kind of diffractive kind of reading analogy it's that waves um, the kind of ways shift and change and our kind of, and the idea that we have to pay attention to these, and you mentioned that sound is not the same for everyone because as it crosses over the contours of the face or the lobes, it creates this sort of differential. I saw a kind of overlap there. Um, and then in terms of the kind of potentia and power um, linking to the idea of power of law or the force of law last night seems to have um, another very kind of strong overlapping. Um, and I'm wondering if, I'm just wondering what, I'm almost asking you guys to get in conversation with each other, you four, to think about those cross currents, because I think maybe there is implied in here a kind of method of, of, of reading between these things more accurately um, if we were to try to intersect those ideas. That was really noble. Um. <laughs> I'm not ready to respond myself yet. Well, thanks. <laughs> hmm? um, so maybe we should head over to the coffee break. Uh, and we're going to begin a little bit later. We're going to start at 4.30. <laughs> <laughs>